Uh, I thought today I would um, yeah, got that going. Uh, make um, sort of th give you an impression of uh, Norco as it is today. Um, then talk a little bit about our experiences in China, and then sort of try to wrap it up about. We're hearing a lot about corporate investment, fam uh, f uh, family farms, but talk through some of those issues that um, really mean if we wish to actually take those opportunities forward into Asia, that we can do that um, with uh, additional milk supplies. So to give you a sense of Norco, Norco is one of the. Um, um, last bastions in um, the cooperative model where we still have one member, one vote, which um, started in 1895. So it's, it's a traditional uh, cooperative. It has its own set of challenges, but it works for us today. But, uh, and we're a little bit different as a cooperative um, in the sense that we, uh, our, we don't have to um, necessarily worry about our shareholders. Um, they are our owners and therefore, and they are our milk suppliers. So we worry about um, what we call total farm gate returns and creating uh, stable uh, milk prices. And one of the challenges that we've always put, and why I've put the, um, the pie chart up there around our, um, our business mix, is uh, my experience in the industry, which I've been around for some time now, has actually shown us that um, the, the challenges in the north that we actually uh, face is about maintaining a, a relatively stable milk price and an ever-increasing milk price to keep um, up with the pace of inflation. And so over a period of time, we've developed this model where 70% of our milk um, business is milk related, either through um, sales of fresh milk or processing of ice cream or manufacturing of ice cream. And the other is actually created from a, a diverse customer base on rural, uh, from the rural retailing uh, business that we operate, which is not just dairy. Dairy actually only operates about, uh, I think it's around 12% of that business. And I'm going to, um, as I had to do a little um, promo here, but um, just to give you a sense of the brands. Brands are incredibly important to all our businesses. Um, and obviously, we also have some great grand awards that actually give us some great uh, leverage into the China market. So let's, let's start talking about China. And one of the things that I think, I just showed you some brands. Uh, and one of the challenges that we've all found with China in our very first experience of putting fresh milk into China was uh, the fact that um, our, our intellectual property on our brands and the capacity for someone to counterfeit that product is very real. Uh, and, but there's some very innovative solutions that um, our Australian friends are, are actually creating. And if you actually think about this um, piece, there's a, a barcode on that app that actually is, sing is individual to that um, bottle of milk and can be tracked uh, via a, uh, an app, a down download of an app in China. and. Um, the, the customer can scan it back to our system at Norco, which will tell you exactly how, how old that uh, bottle of milk is, where it came from, and as soon as the uh, milk use, uh, hits its use-by date, that code will no longer work, so they can't actually activate the code. So there's some very clever, uh, innovative ways, and that's just one example that I would actually uh, thought I would actually talk you through. So um, the, the ice cream business um, is, is also uh, really interesting for us. And, we, and so one of the things that we've, we're really good at Norco is that, um, and the industry has moved to this, um, many of us have actually uh, created um, sectors of the, ca um, the dairy sector that we're actually good in. Norco is very good at actually manufacturing an ice cream. We learned that from companies like Baskin and Robbins that come out of the America in um, the 80s and formed joint ventures with us. Um, whilst that, that joint venture may no longer exist, we learnt to actually make an ice cream and be very good at it. So we've, we've made ice creams for companies like Baskin Robbins, Streets Unilever, and we now do a lot with um, the retail sector in Australia. So in Australia, we don't actually manufacture our own brand of ice cream. And that was driven by the fact that um, some time ago, we, we, we realised that the ice cream segment in Australia, especially the premium segment that actually had the better margins, was so small that the, the really man, the, whilst the margins were larger, the uh, cost of manufacturing small runs was actually problematic for, it, for us. So we exited those brands in around 2006. Uh, but one of the interesting pieces from China's perspective is that those brands now are actually seen to be of great interest to them. And it gives us, and it enters a new world for us in the sense that developing a brand not only uh, nationally but uh, globally uh, becomes a real opportunity because the market's much bigger. And one of the, the challenges here is to, take, um, to give the, the Chinese what they're actually looking for. And, or, and, I, say, and I, sh I shouldn't say Chinese, just it's the Asian community, um, that local fresh feeling about uh, our products and the provenance story behind it. Um, one of the challenges, and just going back to fresh milk for a moment, one of the challenges that we found with the fresh milk market was, um, and I think this gets back to a lot of about our culture and um, the Asian uh, experience, was that 
many people in China actually think that fresh uh, UHC milk is fresh. So it was it become very confusing for them around how do we market a product? You say yours is fresh, but we say ours is fresh, and there was a great confusion around that. So we've actually we've been slowly working around that, um, and and therein lied and one of the problems that um, that transposed when we actually talked about fresh product. Um, the premiums that were uh, perceived in the market were uh, uh, actually quite high. But one of the challenges that we now face is that um, the market in China has also learned how to get around those high premiums. So lots of people talk, I think someone said $20 a litre for camel milk before. Well, my first question is how many litres do they sell? Because if you sell two, it doesn't make you rich. Um, and so one of the challenges that we've actually faced is whilst you um, can see uh, fresh milk in China um, on a shelf for somewhere between eight and eleven dollars, depending on where it is. It's about making sure you sell as much of that as possible uh, on the shelf, and the consumer not actually trying to um, get it when the use-by date is getting closer to the the end. So there's plenty of challenges on on that on that price price sensitivity, and the Asian community is very very clever around that. So we found that um, working with the distributors and the retailers in China and educating the market is really, really quite necessary. So it means that, um, from our perspective, making sure the retailers or the people selling their product don't necessarily give that product away or uh, discount it when it gets close to the end. If you want to maintain that premium, it certainly needs to be that uh, marketing edge needs to be um, taken through and supported uh, through, the, through the system. But I think that the other challenge there is that, um, educating ourselves, and, and I think this is um, it's like a marriage or, and a development of a new relationship. We both, um, uh, uh, the, the Asian and the Australian people, are trying to figure out where we fit together and how we can actually um, work relationships. Racing in and trying to do a deal in a week, in a month, in, t in six months just doesn't work. There needs to be um, plenty of um, thought process around it. And one of the challenges that um, we actually talk about is the dynamics of the product that we actually sell. So in, in Australia, we've actually, uh, and, and we've actually certainly got some um, products that we think and capabilities that we think is great, but just things like portion size. A 500 mil tub, I showed you a moment ago, a, I'll probably flip back to that, a 500 mil tub. Now that might seem like a really nice size in Australia, and that's probably the, grow, the largest growing category in Australia, but for a Chinese that's too big. Can't get it in their fridge, they like to eat it on the way home. So um, a whole set of challenges around, the, around that um, piece. So the next piece I wanted to talk about was um, the, the di distinct opportunities that we actually have. And just going back to that piece around, um, there was um, a, the cap it's not only the capability, but it's about the fascination with this Australian provenance story and the local brand. So now whether it's an Orco product or a Bega product or a Murray Goldman product, um, we need to be able to make sure that we um, can formulate it a product that actually is suitable for their market. So you may actually very well have a, a Norco product and it may be a, um, a native product, it may have um, lychee in it or it may have um, green tea, but um, making sure that product is um, branded Norco as gives us one opportunity, but the second opportunity to that is that then making sure that the product has another style of product actually has the opportunity of their own styles of chase, um, um, their own style. And we think that's actually the larger opportunity in the, in the longer term. The, the challenge for us is to actually create relationships with retailers and um, hit that segment really hard with uh, new, new relationships and, and fine tune those relationships while we, while, while we actually develop that, the tastes and the profiles that they actually want around that product. And, and the interesting piece is uh, cracking the market is, is really interesting. We do have those O oh, uh, light bulbs moments and in the event that how do we actually supply, supply the market when it actually takes off because you've got to think about um, in, a, in, in our part of the world where we uh, have a manufacturing ice cream business in Lismore it's running at almost full capacity the Australian market's actually almost taken it up so um, we could double the size of that factory overnight by just one major customer in China so there is a level of overwhelmingness around how do we access capital in the short term in, in the event that that actually takes off so we haven't taken our eye off the ball on that but, and this gets back to if we think, need to think about portion size, flavours, styles uh, of product, um, that op brings in the opportunity for, for new technology and new um, entry points in the marketplace. So we, we are certainly uh, communicating with our, um, our members and our um, bankers in the sense that um, there is plenty of opportunity for investment with the right partner and we're certainly working on a lot of those opportunities. But one of the, um, the, cha um, the challenges, and I'm talking predominantly now about ice cream, but one of the challenges that we actually um, 
have as a positive in our part of the world. Most ice cream in Australia is manufactured between the months of July and January. So uh, a facility in, in manufacturing ice cream may very well have uh, spare capacity between February and June, which actually fits with the Northern Hemisphere uh, summer. So, um, there is, um, so to some degree our productivity um, can improve dramatically by just uh, accessing a market and a, and a medium, medium size. So something of interest and certainly of value to our, our business and our members. But one of the, the pieces um, that I think um, the Australian industry, and, and I say this uh, cautiously, I think the Australian industry in agriculture suffers is the rest of the world hears about our volatility in our clima climatic conditions. They hear about the floods and they hear about the droughts and Dorothy McKellar said it really, really well. And so um, one of the challenges that we've actually had in our business is to explain to our customers why our, our milk prices actually are of higher value and therefore they pay a higher ingredient price. But with that comes consistency in, in, in supply. We are not a seasonal commodity player. We do not actually necessarily um, offer our customers a low spring price for a product. We actually go in with a, a price that is actually uh, at the market rates that we're actually selling, um, buying from our farmers and knowing for well that we actually have a consistency of, of supply right through the year. So we don't have a dramatically, in our business, we do not have a dramatic um, downturn in our milk in the autumn period like other processes. Uh, and that's a challenge for us to actually explain that and actually get them to understand it. Uh, certainly once our um, Asian friends have been to um, Australia, they fully understand the process. And we've had great success in that um, work with uh, the Japanese market and now the uh, Chinese market. So a, a geographic spread, and how we explain this, uh, if you think about um, milk as far as either side of Kingaroy, which is in Queensland, down to as far as just out of uh, Sydney, there's around a 1,400 kilometre distance uh, of milk. Now it's unusual for that, that um, area, to, in size of area, to actually have any one event that is actually significant to it, um, either either area. For example, the floods I think they had in Queensland some years ago, um, back in uh, 2011 I think it was, um, they didn't affect our southern supply. So um, that gives us some uh, a de-risking uh, perspective on our milk uh, on our milk business, which gives us reliability. Uh, and, and we really do think that the whole reliability piece is the key for us in explaining the market. So the, the, the challenge then is, uh, I've said that we've actually got some great brands, we've got some great interest, we're developing the capacity. Then if you looked at the, um, uh, the data that we're showing in Australia is, where's the milk going to come from? We know that the, uh, what's driven are some of the changing arrangements um, from the retail sector in Australia with longer terms is the, the very fair factor that Australia is actually going to be more focused on uh, exporting and seeking premium markets than actually the domestic market. So um, we've actually put a lot of energy into our farm sector and the reason for diversity in our business is to protect our farmers from the volatility of milk prices. So if you looked, and I should have actually, and I thought about this later, a graph would have been great, but our milk price variability in the last um, five to six years has been no more than three to four percent. In fact, it's actually been rising. So, you know, so that's actually driven our farm, farm growth. If you, I think, in my view, the, the industry's changed. If you actually uh, look back in um, the 90s and early 2000s, if you drop the milk price, you got more milk. Today, if you drop the milk price, you'll get less milk. It's just the way the farming sector has um, changed its behaviour. Um, we, interestingly enough, our, um, and I call it the life jacket moment, we um, have had 13 startups in, in our um, business, mostly smaller farms are starting up. Uh, but just like I started with 60 cows milking uh, over 400 cows, you, you actually grow with your time. So we're actually now putting the life jacket around these smaller farms, actually trying to help them start um, their business, businesses and grow it and grow it with us. So um, yes, we've had some corporate farms actually show some interest and actually get involved with Norco, but we're also seeing a larger proportion of smaller farms start up and investing in agriculture. And that, and, the reason I say, um, and I, I usually call them the younger farmers, but some of them are in their 50s, but when, they, uh, when you get new farmers and you, um, even if it's corporate farms, when you get new people into your business, they bring new ideas and they, and they put pressure on the, um, the, the current farmers to actually change their ways. So, and I think that's really important that my caution about our business model and our pricing arrangement is, is that people get comfortable with it and won't actually change it and therefore become uncompetitive in the longer term. So we really do certainly um, encourage our farmers to um, think about in uh, increasing their investment on farm, not only for pro from productivity, from a labour perspective, but a genetic, uh, whether that's grass or a cow. 
Uh, and we, we certainly are confident. We have, um, we'll also say we've got 13 farms. We have about another seven or eight farms that are actually in the wings in, in um, bringing on milk supply. So we do also, um, well, most people think cooperatives are, are free and easy and you can just come in and start whenever you want. We very much control how much milk we bring into our business to manage our profit uh, levels. So um, one of the, the challenges, um, as I said earlier, was about remain, um, remaining cost competitive. And so the, the challenge for us here is, um, with De we, in collaboration with Dairy Australia, we were very supportive of the Focus Farm initiative from Dairy Australia. It was a rebuild of, um, in my view, um, what went on a number of years ago where uh, farmers got together every so often and actually looked at their business and pulled it apart. This is much more a coordinated approach, uh, professional approach, and um, many of the cynics that we seen, saw in our area thought that it wouldn't work are certainly um, very, very focused on it. And I think the farmer that we chose in our part of the world saw a 17% farm, pro uh, farm improvement productivity and I think it was about 21% in profit. Pro and um, at the re most recent field day in November, he made the comment, I just do it better, which is exactly what it was about doing it from, uh, with um, the same resources. And one of the... Um, and so the, I always see ABEAR as an opportunity to actually test our thinking and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully um, get people thinking about the issues. One of the challenges, I think, is how do we redefine the relationships with um, whether it's Dairy Australia, whether it's Norco, the cooperative, whether it's with the um, products of um, um, suppliers. So that, that might be a fertiliser company, might be an Insatec, might be a Verbac, it could be anyone that's supplying product into the industry. They all have innovation, they all have opportunity, and they all have opportunity to bring it to the farm sector. How we bring that together and actually work with them to do that is, I think, is a really interesting uh, way to actually go forward. Doing what we've been doing in the past where we wait for that to come forward, I think needs to be really challenged and tested. So that's all about innovation and technology. I, um, I think um, Malcolm Turnbull has done a, a great job in bringing innovation to the table and putting it at the forefront of Australia. I think that's where, if we look at our, our stagnant growth and we look at um, the growing volumes of milk in not only New Zealand but Europe, if Australia stands still and allows ourselves to be, um, remain or, or move to a point of uncompetitiveness nature, then we really do um, challenge ourselves in being an export, uh, seen as an export player. Um, one of the, the challenges, as I said, um, and I'm, I'm a, I've got a son that's uh, very keen to buy the family farm, pushing dad out, which is all fine, um, just pay the money. But <laughs> um, I think it's about wealth creation. I think how do you create, and it's great to see that we've actually got a new uh, um, increasing influx of kids into universities and doing uh, courses in relation to agriculture. They're the kids that are, in my view, that will actually own their farm. They may not own it when they're 25 to 30 like I did. They may own it when they're 40 to 50 but they are more likely to move to that position and be the, um, the farmers of the future. And, that's, and we've got to encourage them through wealth creation. If we think about the generations that most of us here have come from that are farmers, we have come from a very small, humble beginning uh, and actually got reasonable assets as we grow. And I think that's what we need to encourage the next generation, the kids that are leaving school and uh, moving to universities. Uh, and as we say, we must produce more from less. That's a, that's a given, and how we do that, I think, is a challenge for all of us. One of the, um, the pieces is about um, the, that I spend a bit of time talking to our members about is how do we prepare you for that supply volatility? How do we protect you from the marketplace in, in the event that there's a, a calamity or, or a significant change? And, and, so, and this gets back to um, the point, this, I don't see any excuse for us to pick up the phone or send an email to, uh, or, or hop on a plane and go and visit a customer in Japan, China, Asia, doesn't matter where it is, and say, sorry guys, I can't supply you, we've actually had a catastrophe. It doesn't work, it doesn't cut it. We've actually got to have some um, strong strategies to do that. So how do we do that at Norco? So um, our geographic spread, as I said earlier, actually is a, um, a significant piece to our story. We, um, so we support members to invest and grow, so we use the life jacket piece about putting it around it for those young farmers to actually make sure that they can actually grow. But more importantly, we actually have a whole heap of policies that we've um, put in place with our members to protect them. Now, whether it's around milk pickups when um, a tanker can't get in due to flood, whether it's about antibiotic testing and they've failed the system, uh, whether it's about drought um, piece, whether it's about a death in the family, we have a whole raft of policies that we can, um, our member services team know and our directors and our senior management team know that we can draw upon to actually support our farm network at those times of need. And my final slide today is around changing the garden. Just a reflection point for people. 
is it um, my generation that come through the uh, industry in the 80s, then moved into that cycle of deregulation, the scary thought process, what de deregulation is. By the time we got to the mid-90s, we knew it was going to happen. Then it did happen and, and chaos hit uh, very, very quickly. And if you s look at the Queensland industry, it's been um, almost halved by it. Um, and, the, and that's meant that there's been a changing of relationships, whether it's through um, the government, Sterry Australia or other in, uh, providers. We are seen as a different industry and we need to actually uh, grasp that and actually work with it. So that means we need to think about who is going to provide the services that our farm sector wants, who is going to stimulate our farm services. In my view, it won't be the government. And I'm, I'm, uh, it is more likely to be the people that actually work within the, within the sector. And I think that's where the response, responsibility lays. But more importantly, the new generation of people that are actually coming into the agri-sector, they know nothing about deregulation. It's a story to them and it's like, oh, Dad, don't tell me that. It's, it's, you know, I'm not interested. It's, you know, it's, they're not interested. It's history and we need to move on and they're moving on and they, they will bring their new ideas and innovation and technology advancements with them. Um, just fantastic opportunities. And I, and I think my final, final point for the uh, All Us processes, um, I think we need to find new partnerships, not only, down the, not only with ourselves as, as processes, but further down the supply chain. Now, and I keep saying that, whether it's industry providers, whether it's our farmers, but we need to challenge ourselves and find new ways to do things. Thank you very much.